Our scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew 6, 24 through 33. Here Jesus is speaking to a large crowd. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of those. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here ends the lesson. So it's sort of become a practice of mine when I'm working on my sermons during the week to do some kind of post on Facebook and see what pops up amongst friends who want to make a comment. So this week I asked the question, uh, are you a chronic worrier? And if so, what do you do? And people had all kinds of nice responses as the day went on. Some said, I pray, I let God have my worries. There's so many of them. Some said, I write them down, and that seems to help me get them out of my mind. Others said, I talk to a friend who doesn't try to fix me. There were lots of good comments from uh, people who answered the question, are you a chronic worrier? And then I came across the comment from my friend Clay, and he said, yes, indeed I am. In fact, I spend my days fighting bad guys everywhere, all the time. I am full of righteous wrath, and I cannot stop myself from smiting evil in all its forms. I am indeed a chronic warrior. <laughs> and then there's that little, oh, oh, a warrior? Oh, never mind. Now, Clay's chronic warrior is in many ways the sort of over-the-top counterpoint to the many worry warts who spend their time and energy in a very different world. Worriers get caught in that cycle of always considering the unfortunate things that might happen. Worriers are always considering the unfortunate things that might happen. Like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, there's a little dark cloud over the worrier's head they spend a great deal of time in fear and with a lack of hope. Now, this is not the same thing, and I want to be clear, as someone who is uh, suffering from serious depression, whether it's mild or severe, a person who has a body chemistry problem that causes a dark and disquieting worldview to overwhelm their life. While some people who suffer from depression may, in fact, be worriers, there are lots and lots of worry warts in the world who are not chemically depressed. And they don't necessarily act fearful and hopeless all the time. They can be very caring and likable, uh, very witty and compassionate and charming. They're tremendously loyal friends, and they have a sincere desire to be helpful. They are highly responsible people. One might say often they are overly responsible people. So if the worry ward in your life begins to worry about you, it can seem intrusive or pushy or even judgmental as if you don't have the sense to take proper care of yourself. All of us kind of stare into our unknown futures, and sometimes that causes us worry or concern. But worry warts stare into the future, and they can only see what might go wrong, the unfortunate thing that just might happen. They're seeking some kind of security and safety, and they just can't find it. So they sound a little pessimistic, to say the least, sometimes actually paranoid. 
and they're always on the lookout for what could go wrong. And this is very, very hard to turn off. So worry warts tend to be a little bit resigned in life. They have a fairly low expectation. The other shoe is going to drop. Something is going to go wrong. We, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, greets Christopher Robin this way. He says, good morning, Christopher Robin. If it is a good morning, which I doubt. For the worrier, everything is a potential source of disappointment or stress or deep anxiety. Now, I do want to say a few words in defense of worrying. This is important. Psychologists say that people who are more pessimistic, which certainly includes worriers, are much more clear, honest, and accurate about what is actually happening in the world. They have a more realistic worldview than some of us who look at the world through rosy colored glasses. Just because people are worried doesn't mean they're wrong. Worriers sometimes raise the questions nobody wants to hear in the family system or in the business meeting or in the church council. They ask those, but what if questions? And they ask questions that are not easily answered, but seriously need to be considered in a complicated world. Worriers are usually not made up out of thin air. You can lose your job in this economy. You might lose your house in this market. Your daughter might, in fact, not stick with rehab. Children do get kidnapped from schoolyards. Terrorists do, in fact, make terror. Likewise, your house guests might arrive early and catch you a little unprepared. Your friend might not like the movie that you recommend. One ant in the bathroom could mean a full-on invasion, and it's possible always to say or do the wrong thing. So the small worries seem to tap into the same hard place as the great big worries, and you roll it all together, and this can be a pretty overwhelming life. Well, what does Jesus say about this? Is there any good news for the worry wart? If you recall the lesson today, Jesus was talking about money and clothing and food and shelter. These were big worries for people in his time and big worries for lots of people today. And so what does he actually say? Well, he says, don't worry. Oh, way to go, Jesus. I mean, we know what happens. We know the bad psychology of telling somebody not to do something. Whatever you do, don't look behind you right now. Don't look. Don't look. Don't think about chocolate. Whatever you do, don't hum that little Bobby McFerrin tune. Ah, it's irresistible. As soon as somebody tells you not to do something, that's very compelling. What was Jesus thinking? Because now worriers have to worry about how much they are worrying. But in all seriousness, Jesus says more than don't worry. And he might be speaking an important truth to a hillside full of vulnerable people who were legitimately concerned about the basics of their everyday life. Maybe he was saying exactly what they needed to hear. Oh, my friends, don't worry. This worrying, it's not going to add one hour to your life. This worry, it's not going to fix any of the struggles that you are facing. We know that worry can overwhelm. And earlier in this passage, Jesus says that you can't serve two masters. And I like to think, when I think about that passage, that worry can be your master. It can so overwhelm you that God takes a back seat. If worry is your master, you actually have to do something to change that. What do you do? Well, Jesus describes this very clearly. First, you seek God's kingdom. 
God already knows what you need and what you want. If you're seeking the kingdom first, the rest will come. Now, this is not the gospel of prosperity that you might hear on TV or radio, where if you're just a good Christian, you're going to have a very prosperous, good life. No, this is actually something quite different from that. This is saying step outside yourself and your own particular worries and focus on the kingdom of God because that is focusing on the greater good. So if you focus on the kingdom of God, you are serving then one master, God's very self. If you are trying to follow Jesus who is always pointing to God, then you are following the one who has shown us the love of God right here on earth in human form. And in that showing, in that human form, has offered us this kingdom of God. Now, when my family lived in uh, Eugene, there was a a really serious year, a a year of serious homelessness uh, in town, and I was working on the staff of Trinity Methodist Church there. And we remodeled and kind of redid a couple of Sunday school classrooms into really temporary basic apartment so that uh, we could help one family at a time with some kind of transition. And during that time, one member of the congregation stepped forward, Warren, time after time, with each family that came and stayed for a period, he would get to know them. And he would help them learn how to balance their checkbook and learn how to shop intelligently with the food dollars that they had. And he kind of saw what they needed and he was their advocate and their friend and their helper in very, very significant ways. And one time I had a chance to ask him, Warren, why, why do you do this ministry? You're, you're just so invested. And he said, well, here's the truth. I have a daughter and a grandson, and they are one rent check away from the streets. And because of the way in which she has chosen to live her life, there is nothing else I can do to help them. And so instead of worrying about her, I've decided to just do all I can to help other people who find themselves without home and housing and who need to find their way back. Do you see how this works? Do you see how this satisfies what Jesus said? Instead of sitting with your own worry, you do something that seeks the greater good. You do something that seeks God's kingdom and offers God's kingdom. It seems to me that there could be creative ways for us, any of us, but especially our worriers, to find ways to step out of the small worlds where it all seems so big and so important and leap out into the world and act on behalf of someone else. Now, that does take effort. It does take looking carefully and prayer, and it does take courage. But one of the other things that is repeated over and over and over again in the Bible is do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. It is a reassurance from God that God has a vision that includes all of the concerns, all of the worries, all of the struggles of our lives. It's an assurance that we can come out from hiding under those dark little clouds of worry and we can act like warriors instead. Not making war on anything, but working courageously as protectors, as advocates, as strong movers and shakers, as champions for other people. To do this automatically brings some hope, some new possibilities, some new energy, some joy real joy. It's enough to make a person want to hum. Amen. <laughs>